Hello everyone, we hope you're all doing very well. Today, a very special interview. It's Simon Pearson. If you don't know who he is, then let me look at his CV. We've got this kind of stripped down CV here. And if you look at that CV and it makes you think that you've just wasted your life, then you feel the same as me. That's quite a CV, Simon. Thank now, you. we got to know you through Eagle Dynamics because you work for Eagle Dynamics and we got together, it must have been a couple of years ago now, I suppose. Kind of been friends with the group ever since. Uh, but what we're here for really is, well, to talk about whatever people ask, but mainly it's going to be about the fact that you served in the RAF, 1980 to 1999, I believe. Yeah, gosh, that makes me sound and feel very old. That's, I, that's, I get that feeling a lot. Right, um, so I'm not going to read through this EV, but if you want, you can read it there, and including uh, writing and media activity that you've got there, and I'm sure most of you would have read uh, those books that we've got there, and so on. So, before we get stuck in to the questions which come from you guys, the viewers, we always ask you guys for the questions because you always give us the best questions. Number one, what do you think of the evolution of fighters and jets from there where they have started to today's modern fighters and where you kind of fit in to it i suppose well i think that's an excellent question when, when you look at the evolution of fighters in world war ii you you end up actually with a lot of them with uh you know mustang and, and spitfire with bubble canopies uh, and those kind of designs were lost in the 50s and 60s when you looked at the phantom and the thunder chief and mm -hmm. uh the a6 and the a7 and all those you know the f8 there are lots of designs where they kind of lost the plot and mm -hmm. it was only when they came up against the MiG-21 and started getting shot down I thought well hang on a minute we need to see out again so we're back to we went through a big period then of bubble canopies again mm -hmm. uh, through the F-16, F-15, F-18 and what's really slightly bizarre is that the um, the um, Lightning II is not a bubble canopy, mm -hmm. it, uh, so so I just wonder if we're coming to the end of visual dogfighting, mm. which is a which should be a great disappointment. I mean, mm -hmm. I would say the answer to that is probably not, because somebody will always run out of missiles. The first game mm -hmm. always in fighter combat. I'm no expert, by the way, is to run the opponents out of missiles, and then you end up as these Israelis always say, with guns and guns mm -hmm. never miss. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. yeah. My, my terrible understanding, but an understanding of the, nonetheless, is that we can develop lovely fighters like the Raptor and the Lightning with stealth technology and amazing sense, array of sensors and stuff like that. But the enemy is pretty much always going to develop a counter to those. And what seems to happen is no good how you, no matter how good your sensors are, no matter how good your stealth you are, you, one way or another is you're going to end up five miles away from the bad guy having to VID him or something like that. And so, I mean, that's what history has taught us, right? Correct. History t tells us it doesn't matter how good the technology is, you always end up uh, doing knife fight in a phone box. Uh, you, know, you, you look at Randy Cunningham, one of the uh, USF-4 aces in Vietnam, he says he could have had five to ten more kills in his Navy F-4 if he'd had uh, a gun. Roger. And there was reason why they got rid of the bubble canopy, though, wasn't it? I mean, bubble canopies are inefficient, aren't they, aerodynamically? Does anyone know that? Or am I speaking incorrectly there? Yeah, I, do you know what? I think that they got rid of it simply because they wanted to make space. You look at a lot of the dorsal stuff that goes mm -hmm. on, it's compared to avionics. Mm -hmm. uh, so after the original design, lots of dorsal stuff was added, actually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and avionics was put there, so... Right, yeah, see me 21. They get rid CFR. of it because of maybe they didn't have the technology to make a canopy that would withstand the, the speeds of the new aircraft. Um, oh, no. bubble. Could they make a bubble that would go Mach 1.2 at the time? Well, the F 16. Yeah, 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 yeah. And also, I mean, before that, I'm not talking about the F 16, but just after. Oh, I, oh, you know, I don't know. I do know that the, 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 the canopy strength test was always firing a frozen chicken at it for a mile yeah. an hour. <laughs> <laughs> okay very good um yes very good well, we could talk all day about this but we shall we shall push on number two how would you describe the step up in technology in the tornado compared to the buccaneer so maybe you can just briefly explain just very explain your history and, and, and what you did just in, in few sentences so that so the valuable viewers know and then the answer to the question please sure uh, so the buccaneer was very much what we would call a steam driven aircraft in that it had two engines that worked. It carried four bombs um, internally. Uh, it had a map and it had a navigator in the back who had a stopwatch and a map. Uh, and that was it pretty much. It was hopeless at night. We used to fly at night, rarely. 
Uh, we couldn't fly low level at night, really. The, the radar was very poor. We were supposed to do something called map matching radar predictions, which we pretended to practice and used to cheat by peeking out the window. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so it was a day bomber that could go to the other side of Poland and back, by mm -hmm. the way, mm -hmm. at 540 knots uh, at three foot six. So, uh, you know, it, it was, and of course we considered ourselves to be the best of the best. So that was the, that was the bucket. It had no technology. Mm -hmm. It did have something called the JPIC, which was like a, uh, an early inertial nav, uh, which the maritime fleet used to use over the Ogin, doing JMCs up over in the GI UK Pharaoh's Gap, uh, trying to find, you know, Russian um, Sverdlos class uh, cruisers, which it was designed to, the Buccaneer mm. was designed specifically against that threat. Um, and this thing, but it, it would kind of run away. It, would, it was a kind of a mechanical thing, and it would run away. You'd be about mm -hmm. five miles in error for about every hour that you flew. So it was as good as almost hopeless. Um, so it was very much map and stopwatch. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so that when the tornado came along, of course, it was just astonishing. We could fly at night at 200 feet in any weather, we, with a full load, we could only get to Berlin and back, so the range is a bit limited, and only at 480 knots, because otherwise we couldn't get even barely to Berlin and back. Um, but but the uh, weapon delivery accuracy was amazing. The radar was fantastic, uh, and you know, the, the 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 following on the only aircraft that's really close to it at all is the uh, F111, mm -hmm. uh, with its terrain following um, capability. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, it, it just absolutely astonishing, the Tornado. You know, really brilliant, brilliant aircraft. Roger. I've got, I guess you can't see on my screen, I've got a wonderful picture that has come up on, on Google here of just some awesome fighters. And I hope that most of our viewers are American. I just hope that they, uh, respect is the wrong word, but just um, kind of revere these planes I've got in front of me as much as we do. We've got a, a pair of Tornadoes. I'm guessing it's a fighter and a ground attack variant. I can't remember how to tell the difference now. We've got the Buccaneer, all in formation. And we've got the Jaguar as well. That era of planes is just so awesome. Let's push on. Number three, which out of the two jets do you prefer and why? Really good question because you don't necessarily just prefer it because it's more modern. Um, what's your answer to that? Uh, for pure fun, snotting around the Highlands at super high speed um, on the deck, the Buccaneer by Miles. Uh, simply because you could happily go, uh, you know, above 540 knots and so nine miles a minute and go forever. Um, for going to war, though, the tornado, um, simply yeah. because, uh, you, you know, it, it could actually do the job. Whereas the Buccaneer, we'd have, you know, we'd have spread bombs somewhere near the target, probably. <laughs> <laughs> Roger. <laughs> probably. Yes. It didn't stop us regarding, regarding ourselves very highly, I have to yeah. say. No, of um, course. Then, we're going to war, definitely the tornado by miles um, for for pure peacetime fun, um, the Buccaneer. But actually, my favourite aircraft to fly, and just because the back seat visibility is so fantastic, would be the Hawk. How oh, interesting! Absolutely yeah. beautiful aeroplane, and you know one big vacuum cleaner. And once that got wound up to max, it that was quite pokey too. So, mm. uh, so um, yeah, good question. It was really the, 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 it, 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 love aircraft, though. I think. We well, yeah, had the Hawk in DCS for a few years, and uh, whatever you think about it, I mean, that cockpit was a lovely cockpit to look out of, and it was, a, like you said, it was a kinetic, kinematically, it was actually a really top plane, 450 knots or whatever you could max out at. It was pretty hardcore. Mm, okay. Very good. Okay, that's pun shot. Was the Buccaneer capable of supersonic speeds? No. No, not, no, not really. Um, the... The fastest I did was 585 indicated at 100 feet over the North Sea. Nice. Uh, we, we had some aircraft that were faster than others. The fastest I ever saw on the clock in the front was 585. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, approaching uh, 10 miles a minute, 10 nautical miles a minute. So, but uh, but uh, no, not supersonic in the Buccaneer. Mm. Do you mean some were faster than the others in that they were different versions or that they were literally just no, no, a different no, plane? No, no. Just, just different, same plane, same mm -hmm. engines, just... It's just somewhat just like racing cars. Built just, on a Monday. It's so yes, it's yeah. so British, well, isn't it? I we um, had one. I think was, I think it was Foxtrot. Was our particular was the fastest jet on uh, sixteen squadron yeah. uh, at the time. Yeah. So it was faster than all the others. I remember there was a really really famous electric lightning. Um, I can't remember what they called it. They called it a special name because it would go so much faster than the others. Ah. Uh, 
Okay. I don't know. Okay, let's push on, guys. Uh, was this is interesting because I never thought about it at all. Was the tornado a decent dogfighter, or could it have been? Maybe it uh, would be a better answer. No, I didn't. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, compared to what? Compared mm. to the F, F, Let's look at the contemporaries that, that I got into fights with. Uh, if you look at the F sixteen and F fifteen, got thrashed every time. Mm. Uh, empty tornado uh, against. Uh, an F4, German F4s or American F4s, uh, yes, it could hold its own. Uh, so in, in, in as much as the Phantom is a reasonable dogfighter, yes, the Tornado could be a reasonable dogfighter, but but uh, not really. You don't want to go up against proper dogfighters mm-hmm. you know, like the F-15 and, mm-hmm. and MiG-29 and, you know, Flanker. Mm-hmm. Not a hope. Not a hope, unless you got really lucky, so or or had a complete idiot in the uh, in the other aircraft. Roger. Yeah, I think that would yeah. be probably m- more or less what we would have guessed. Yeah. I didn't stop us carrying nine lemurs or even nine bravas in the buccaneer case, mm-hmm. and uh, and pretending that we had so, uh, half decent and, and even practice firing them, uh, and uh, and nine golfs as well in the tornado in the early days. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, so uh, yeah, but uh, but but no, is the honest answer. Not not even not really very capable. Roger. Which is why the F3 was such a terrible design, mm-hmm. probably. Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> Get hammered for that. Yeah. <laughs> it was, you know, it's kind of an embarrassment, I think. Okay, we might go on to that later. We'll see. Um, I've heard stories from Royal Navy pilots that the Buccaneer could hold its own in a dogfight. Would you agree with this? Mm, how old? Yeah, that's a very good question. Against what? Yep. You know, I'm, I'm trying to rack my brains. If you're fighting against, oh, goodness me, B 52? I think the answer to that is clearly no. I do. Uh, but neither, you know, the, the A-10. No, because, you know, the A-10, the A-10, I mean, I've been into fights with A-10, A-10s on dog, you know, dog fights with A-10s, and they tend to just stand it on mm-hmm. its left or right wing mm-hmm. and pull a right right circle until they bring the the um, the Gatling gun to bear. Mm-hmm. So, um, and the Buccaneer, we just ran away. We would always avoid, we would always avoid, oh, hang on a minute, I suppose um, F-104s, we were quite reasonable. <laughs> You're no, sc- no, no. scraping the uh, barrel now, Simon. Mention it, of course, and this of course dates me. In the early days, we might occasionally mix it with um, with German 104Gs, and and um, even I'm uh, just thinking about the Drakens were not that great either. But on the squadrons in Germany, because there were no two stick buccaneers, we used to have um, hunters. Each squadron mm-hmm. had a hunter. The wing had two or three hunters, mm. so we had a lot of time down over the over the Ardennes, over the low flying area, with flying six, four, six, eight ships of buccaneers against single or pair hunter bounce, simulating MiG twenty one or twenty three doing, you know, vis low cap type stuff. Mm. So that was that was, um, you know, I was doing that, I suppose, at the age of twenty two, I guess, something like that. So mm-hmm. okay. I, I thought I thought nothing of it. <laughs> <laughs> Just normal back then, yeah. Well, obviously, that's Roger. What you did. Okay, very good. Uh, where do we get to next? Uh, the Buccaneer had a blown flap system. Wasn't aware of that. So, like the MiG twenty one for slow speed carrier landings. Did the RAF version continue to continue to use these, or were they not needed for land bases? Yeah, we did. We had to use it in the summer. Um, uh, the blown the blown system um, for for takeoff, uh, especially on hot days. We always used it for landing, regardless. Uh, but for takeoff on hot days, we had to go into the ODM, the Operating Data Manual, and look up the look up the charts. And always had to use it at jib because normally at Gibraltar, you've probably seen the videos at jib. Mm-hmm. The Buccaneer, you get airborne by putting the gear up. Normally, mm-hmm. uh, well, you, know, you go off the end of the runway and put the gear up because it's only six thousand feet. Mm-hmm. So hot day, summer at jib was always a bit of a you know uh, a bum bum squeeze, a bit of a, you know. <laughs> Yeah. We always felt very low, mm-hmm. so uh, but you know we never had any mishaps there. Okay, and just in case any viewers are wondering about the blown flaps, so my understanding is you would pipe some of I think the exhaust gas over the flaps to generate extra lift. Is that right, guys? Oh, yeah. yeah, correct. Right. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, so uh, I have heard stories that the air brake on the rear of the buck was sometimes used to drop countermeasures. Quote unquote. I don't understand what that's really saying, but what does that mean yeah, to you? Well, yeah. Absolutely true. Yeah, the Buccaneer. So our standard warfit was was four retard thousand pounders, Mark eighty threes, mm-hmm. uh, retard tail, 
Uh, on the right wing, we would carry uh, an AIM-9, obviously two in underwing tanks, obviously. Right wing, an AIM-9, and left wing, we had an ALE... I was going to say ALE-40, but I can't remember, but it was a jamming pod. But we had no chaff. So our only chaff was to put it in the air brake at the back. We had a great big bundle of chaff, the equivalent probably of about... 10 to 20 bundles of chaff would be stuffed into the air brake by the engineers. And then when we f were locked up by something like, you know, a Gundish radar or, you know, in simulation in or Gundish uh, red flag, for example, uh, out in the States, but something like um, uh, Fledermaus over Europe, we would pop out this massive cloud of chaff. And that, but that would be it though. Mm, to, one, know, to one go only. One tracking lock. Yeah. So, yeah, true. So it's because so ten so ten bundles of chaff it was thought outweighed the uh, lack of aerodynamics for a few seconds I guess I guess you just have to nip it open a bit just to let yeah, it out. You just blipped it and, mm. and it was out. Yeah. It was a blip. It was not opening all the way out ever. No, mm -hmm. not in that case. Oh well, great story. I get yet another thing I've learned. So that's excellent. Okay, very good, guys. Um, did you practice flat spin recoveries? I'm not sure what plane this is. Or was the tornado and buccaneer not very prone to them? Well, the bomber boys never got themselves into positions where we would really ever be getting ourselves into a flat spin. So the answer is no. Uh, I remember doing a bit of spin recovery uh, and stall recovery, doing a buccaneer air test over Sardinia once, which had a new, I think it had a new, one or two new engines, and we had to take it up to make sure everything worked. Um, so I remember doing, vaguely doing either stall and just, just, just a little bit of spin recovery, but that was all I ever saw. Otherwise, no, generally speaking on a squadron, we never practiced them. Uh, and I think too dangerous, uh, much mm. like the, the old Canberra and its single engine. Mm. You know, I think more, more Canberras were lost. This may be urban myth mm -hmm. but more cameras i think were lost practicing single engine than were lost actual single engine emergency is that because of the yaw yeah yeah correct yeah so um yeah so the answer to that is uh, no not very prone and because we spent most of our time because in the 80s um at low level um almost never at medium level until gulf war came along and changed our thinking slightly um we weren't really didn't really spend much time at medium or high level because, except for transits. Mm. Mm. Um, I interviewed a, a fighter pilot, I forget which plane, a few months ago, and I remember him saying that it was standard practice for fighter pl pilots to practice flat spin recovery. Does anyone know if that's true, or am I imagining that? Maybe I'm imagining it, guys. No, no, that, that sounds true. For fighter pilots, yeah. I mean, they're very much two different worlds, flying mm. two different different profiles you know with a fighter bike you're, off, up, you're often up above you know 10,000 feet 20,000 feet even 30,000 feet and you're pulling high alphas and, and as we all know it's all those who have the f-18 where the pilot mm -hmm. is you know is one vote out of four in the cockpit it's nearly impossible to spin it but mm -hmm. when you get to go the warbirds uh, you'll you know the, the mustang and the spitfires and the fokker wolves and the messerschmitts you'll see how easy it is to spin and you have to know the spin recoveries so uh, if you're doing high alpha dogfighting in non-super modern, and by super modern I mean F-18, F-16 and thereafter, you know, Gen 3 mm. and beyond, um, you don't really need to know the spin recovery. It's, well, sorry, it, it, it's, it's not critical and it's very easy to get out of. Roger, yeah, just press that button and it gets right out of it. Excellent. Okay, guys. <laughs> Um, could you give us a brief overview of the weapons both aircraft carried? Yeah, so I've given the Buccaneer, and we, the, the other, the our other fit was we would carry four uh, slick thousand pounders in the Bombay, uh, and we would uh, the favourite attack for those was something called um, long toss or medium toss, which is where you'd pull up about you'd be doing five forty on the deck, and you'd pull up about five miles away from the target uh, under G and throw them off, throw the bombs off at about 1,500 feet whilst sustaining three to four G and hope they landed mm -hmm. somewhere mm -hmm. in the vicinity of the target. I mean, completely hopeless. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but oddly enough, it was the type of attack that was carried out in Gulf War day one by mm -hmm. the tornado squadrons. They, mm -hmm. you know, they were lobbing eight slick thousand pounders into Iraqi has sites uh, with variable results. And to put it... The, the the idea of standoff dumb bombing like that was to so you don't have to overfly target presumably. 
Yeah, correct. So the Tornado, so in, in contrast, the Tornado's main weapon was the JP-233, uh, which was a runway buster, which carried, which was, so each each Tornado carried two of them on the center line, mm-hmm. um, center line um, uh, pylons. Uh, and this these comprised uh, 47 runway craters each, Sorry, not 47, 28, I think, runway craters each, and 147 uh, minelets. And the idea was that you would send a four ship or an eight ship over a runway and taxiway, and, and, and you know, you drop a football field long pattern uh, and half a foot wide pattern of craters, and then minelets, variable timed minelets or, or acoustic sensitive minelets, or a mix of all of them uh, to deter the. Um, runway repair teams and this was obviously to degrade sortie rates mm. rather than knock out any aircraft we'd also often put them just into has sites because often has sites are on the corners of airfields and there's often one choke point where all of the aircraft in that in that site have to taxi out past one particular point so uh, so that was the that was the theory behind it i mean it, it, and it worked very well in in gulf war one but you know it, it's it, Although a couple did end up in villages, um, which, which was, you know, navigators not doing their job very well. Oh, yeah. Um, but but um, yeah, so, so it was a, it was a, it was a. Well, I don't know really. It, was, it looked like an excellent weapon. I I rather suspect though that the 147 minelets, mm. these they're like you know pop up CBU, uh, a cluster bomb things, um, that they could be hosed off with high pressure hoses from a long distance. Mm. So, uh, so the efficacy of that jury is still out. I'm afraid. Mm, interesting. The two questions to that: this is a dispenser and not a cluster bomb per se. And secondly, did these get banned, or is that my imagination? Uh, yes, it's a dispenser, and no, they didn't get banned because they're not cluster weapons. And latterly, of course, the um, I was the I was the original, the, the first guy to 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 be in charge of. Um, dropping laser-guided weapons from mm-hmm. Tornado. Uh, although I went and got married, so I gave over what was called Lima, the Lima lead to another chap, my best mate, who's uh, from Burnley. A chap called Sean Hughes, top navigator, possibly one of the best there ever was. And he was the guy who uh, who single-handedly um, forged the Tornado laser-guided bomb capability, ah. which we then operation, of course, during the Gulf War. Yep, yeah, which we'll talk about later. Very good. Okay, let's push on. JP two three three cap. Yeah, Roger. I just see. Yeah, I did find it in the end. Um, did you always fly with the same pilot? You were crewed. As, yeah, you were crewed, but no. So um, for all kinds of reasons, um, it, it was it was it was good to fly with the same pilot. And when you were doing, uh, you, and because you qualified together, so you you went from being you know FNG um, on on arrival. Um, I'm assuming everyone knows that what that means. Um, so you went from being yeah. FNGs, FNG front and back, to then you have got pairs lead and then fours lead, and then you know eight ship lead. Uh, so you were it, depending on what you were doing. You know, if you after one, you know, the end of your first tour, often because there were only certain crews who were qualified to do really big missions, you end up flying a lot with the same guy. When you joined, you end up flying a lot with the same guy because you needed to qualify and everything. You know, it's about it's about six months on a squadron before you're considered to be half useful, and before you've done your you know your first combat check and your op check and your you know. So the scrutiny is intense. Mm. Uh, and I'll tell you something else that's really bizarre is that for about uh, well, actually, for, yeah, I think I've stopped having them now since I started flying VR DCS. But I used to have stress dreams uh-huh. about. Yeah, but getting back into uh, people saying, yeah, you know, you're leading, you're leading an eight ship in the morning, and I'm thinking, well, hang on a minute, I can't remember how to switch the back seat on. I can't, you know, I, <laughs> I, and of course I go into this massive panic mode, and I'm in the cockpit, and I'm looking at switches, and I'm trying to remember, and I'm remembering most of them, but you know, so you can tell the the lifetime mm-hmm. stress. You know, well, it's nothing compared to some people, obviously, but that's imprinted on you the constant scrutiny and the scrutiny. The constant need for the fighter pilots and their Rios, Wizos, navigators, backseaters, whatever, to perform. You're only as good as your last debrief, basically. Roger. That's a very good comment there. Okay, guys. Um, let's push on for now. 
Uh, what happened if a navigator had no trust or faith in the pilot? And did you ever feel that way? Yes, but only because I was young and stupid. Um, yes, so I went from being on the Toledo. I went from being uh, my first couple of years uh, from being a very senior ex buccaneer mate at, at the tender age of twenty four <laughs> to, to by the time I was twenty six, twenty seven, being a fairly senior uh, leader in the Toledo force in Germany. To to then being crewed with a new guy. Uh, a pilot and uh, you know I thought uh, and my heart was broken and I thought he was of course he needed coaching and I just thought he was hopeless so I was quite really overly critical of him and asked to be crewed with someone else until I realized that of course we couldn't all lead everything mm. all the time uh, because the the in the early days the the buccaneer that the the tornado force was crewed the back seats were crewed by a mix of ab initios ex-buccaneers guys and ex ex-vulcan guys so of course the ex-Vulcan guys were given a really hard time, and ex-Canberra guys. So ex-Vulcan and Canberra guys were given a really hard time by the Buccaneer boys. We, we were really super aggressive and full of ourselves. Uh, you know, and so I have I have some regrets about my kind of attitude from those days. Roger. Um, but, uh, but but there we are. Roger. Okay, very good. Uh, the next one is about operational deployments. I'm going to put a star by that, and we're going to come back to that one because I figure we'll talk about operational stuff at the end because it's one we, you know, we'll tend to run away with it and we'll take, you know, we'll go on and on, which is good. Sure. But I'm just saying. Um, Fourteen. If the Buccaneer was still in service with the Royal Navy's carriers, would you have considered joining them instead? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. The, my uh, my old man, uh, my old man served was in the navy uh, and served on the Lioness, which was one of Ark Royal's uh, escorts, fleet, uh, um, RFA escorts, uh, and also on the Olness, which was one of its oilers. Uh, and uh, my wife Nikki, her father was a Royal Marine, uh, and he actually served on the Ark as one of its Marines for a while, as well as bulwark and, and other things. And so I was very minded. Even as a lad, I was very minded to uh, to join the navy and fly fleet air arm. But sadly, the ark was disbanded. My father wept as she was turning to razor blades, mm. and um, and I looked at I looked at the numbers, and of course there were, it was sea harriers or helicopters. And I thought, well, hang on a minute, I want to fly jets. So it was the air force for me, despite my family's background. And my my um, big brother Will, he had joined the navy and ended up on destroyers as an ASDIC operator on Leanders. So and single-handedly lost the Cod War. No, I mean won, <laughs> won the Cod War. No, he's an he's he's absolute hero uh, to mm. me, and is flying is today is flying is loving DCS. Oh, mm, good. Uh, well, so especially the Warbirds. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, I would definitely if it if if it were the Fleet Air, definitely. Uh, and you know, a lot of my early instructors, as you can imagine, in the Buccaneer days. A lot of my early instructors were ex Navy guys, or even were, were Navy guys on exchange, mm -hmm. and they had all their squadron patches. To me, I mean, they must have been—I guess they must have been—some of them in their mid thirties. But to me, they were about a hundred and fifty years old and crusty and bearded. <laughs> um, <but laughs> it's amazing how your perspective changes over 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 life. Well, oh, tell me about it, God. Yeah. Right. Okay. Let's push on. Um, following the retirement of the tornado, what happens to navigators? Interesting question. Do some retrain as pilots, or do they swap to non-fighter platforms? Yeah, I think very few, as far as I was aware, uh, trained as pilots. Um, some swapped over, some left and went and did other things. So, so very much a mix of things. You know, it, it, for, for a career officer, or well, I suppose it depends. For a career officer, I mean, some some would have switched to other platforms as well. Some would have gone on to heavies, onto uh, things that still require half decent navigators, like the SF Herc Force. Mm. Um, but uh, you know, very much every everything every situation. Is an individual situation, you know. It's uh, I, I can't really speak from experience mm. because I don't know. Mm -hmm. but we, well, you know, when I left, we we still hadn't really disbanded that many squadrons. In even by 1999, we still had a reasonable throughput. Roger. Okay. Uh, now, bear in mind, obviously, the Buccaneer, due to when it was designed, was nuclear capable. I'm not sure about the tornado. Uh, have you ever flown with a live nuclear weapon? How did you train in the nuclear nuclear role? Well, uh, question one, uh, sorry, is no. Never flew with a live nuclear weapon. Uh, no one ever did, as far as I'm aware, especially after the Americans mm -hmm. lost one over southern Spain. Mm. Um, 
training in the nuclear role, yes. So my first my first Christmas on in Buccaneers was uh, Christmas '83. So I was just at the tender age of 22, uh, and I was on QRA with my man, a uh, young man called Ian Mackay. He went on, I think, to be a very senior BA captain. And we were sitting on two 300 kiloton um, WE-177 nukes, uh, which are 300 kilotons is 20 times the size of Hiroshima mm-hmm. each. One was aimed at, um, one was aimed, I, if I remember correctly, either at Peinemunda or at... Uh, Potsdam, where the headquarters mm-hmm. of the Third Shock Army was, uh, and the other was aimed at the fencer base Stargard, which had a fencer regiment. Mm-hmm. So, um, and how to be trained, we spent, oh, it was so super, super sensitive. So, we spent a lot of time doing the switches and being, you know, you had an army of people with clipboards whilst you did your crew thing, check, you know, it's very strict checklist work, uh, making sure the bombs were armed properly for whatever you were doing low loft, high loft, lay down, low air burst, high air burst. We never did ground burst, of course, because of the um, fallout issues. So, And also the effectiveness. You've got to do you know, low air burst, you know, 800 feet or so. So um, so we did a lot of, lot of uh, time in the HAS, in the QRA HAS, which was, of course, guarded by a company of policemen and, you know, triple wired and all kinds of things, double gated. Um, uh, but we never um, we never um, flew with them. At the end of every exercise, interesting, we did is you know. So any of you who've watched Deutsch in '83 and similar programs, you you'll understand the tension. Everybody wants to know, you know, will the balloon go up? So mm-hmm. at the end of every exercise, we did a lot of lot of war exercises, and they were always the same. So the uh, we always knew that the war was about to end, and this was on about day three of what were called tachyvals, tactical evaluation. Day three, even day four, a really intense one. Uh, uh, the war would end when the second Polish amphibious landing division landed in Denmark, uh, and then the entire wing was launched on its simulated nuclear strike. We would get airborne, fly for an hour and a half around um, North Germany, um, all sprint at high speed at the inner German border, then then nip back to a range on the Dutch border called Nordhorn and do our simulated nuclear strike, and that was it. And home for home for bacon eggs and kippers. Roger. Excellent. Excellent answer. Very good. Okay. Uh, we'll skip over the next one and come back to it. Uh, would you have liked to have worked on with the F4 Phantom? Yeah, I love the Phantom. I mean, it is Who doesn't? possibly the sexiest mm-hmm. looking aircraft ever invented. Mm-hmm. Um, so, simple answer is yes. And, you know, and a lot of my best mates, you know, the, on the, for, for backseaters, the top three or four on the course went Buccaneers and Phantoms. Uh, and so a lot of the guys who I uh, spent time with and got on well with and played football with were all the fast jet boys. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, we, you know, we're similar kinds of people as well. So not unsurprisingly, I suppose. So definitely love it to bits. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We'll answer, we'll answer a future question if I read my list correctly. <laughs> with, does anyone know, is, is it still flying with anyone? It is hung like... Um... Greece, yeah, the, like, Japanese, the Greeks, I think. I think, well, maybe they just retired it. Japanese, the Greeks, the Turks. Um, but you my may God. have some more, more experts than me. I, I just read what I get in Air Forces Monthly. Roger. Okay, yeah. Well, everyone knows and loves the Phantom. Okay, let's push on. Did you ever attend a larger scale exercise, for instance, Red Flag? If so, do you have any cool stories that you could share? Okay, well, best we, I guess we better start doing these. Yeah, very quickly. Yes, yeah, so I did uh, two or three red flags, I think, and one green flag, which was the super secret um, with all the fully W and all the stolen Russian equipment mm-hmm. in the mid-80s, which was fabulous. Mm-hmm. Cool story. Yes, uh, I led uh, with my man, Martin Old, who's also a terrific front-seater. Uh, we led a 120-ship um, coalition guerrilla, um, blue forces against the USAF aggressor squadrons. So that was fantastic, planning and leading that. Um, and apart from that, my last red flag was in 96, I think, 96 or 97. Uh, and it was doing, it was a medium level one, and it was night doing night dive toss uh, with timed, obviously, very strict time on targets, doing dive toss, which is where you climb up to 20,000 feet, you stick it in a, uh, a 10 or 15 degree dive, and then you pull like a bugger. Uh, at about um, 12,000 feet. And again, you do a, you kind of lob it miles and miles and miles away. Mm. 
uh, and um, getting a direct hit with a couple of thousand pounders to the second. Uh, and of course, everybody's watching this in the debrief and the room erupting with cheers. So that was a great moment um, from, from a flag. Apart from that, mostly it's just drinking stories on flags. <laughs> awesome. Okay. <laughs> Um, very good. Do navigators get any flight training, flying training? Yeah, no, but yeah, yeah, yes and no. I mean, a lot of us had hands-on time. A lot of navigators have failed pilots. Um, I was a pilot at uh, I, uh, with the Air Training Corps. I got my pilot's license 16. And when I went to do the do the um, Big and Hill thing, they said, you, well, you're okay as a pilot, but your score's not very good. Uh, they said, but as a navigator, you'll you'll be tornadoes or buccaneers. You'll, yeah. So where do I sign, sir? So I ended up joining as as a as a nav. Uh, I uh, fully fifty percent of the navs were went through pilot training and didn't quite crack it. Mostly uh, being unable to land. Um, that's mm-hmm. why most. Um, <laughs> we, we, we have that we have that problem as well. If you've noticed. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Thankfully, it's not. I'm being unable to air to air refuel. Mm. Uh, but uh, but yeah, so a lot of a, a lot of us were quite happy as backseaters. A lot of them, a lot of navigators, though, viewed themselves as second class citizens. Not helped, by the way, uh, by the ego of you know people like the Harrier Force. You know, there's an old <laughs> thing which is, uh, which you can use for Oxford or Cambridge, by the way. Which is how do you know if you're in a bar and there's a chap there who's a Harrier pilot? And the answer is because he'll tell you within one minute. <laughs> so the same as how do you know when you're in a group of people? Uh, talking to them that any of them went to Oxford. Mm. So, uh, <laughs> did I ask the question? Uh, yeah, did he, yeah did, didn't it? Yeah. Very good. Okay. Was the body refueling capability of the bu- of the Buccaneer used often? No, not really. Um, it was used um, mostly by the maritime guys. It was never used by the overland guys. Uh, it, it was it was fine, but most of the time you've got land-based support, so you'd have the Victor tankers mm. uh, and VC-10 tankers. So, you know, it was fine and somewhat limited given, you know, the limited amount you could give, you could actually fit and then give away in a Buccaneer. So, nice idea, extreme tactical combination of circumstances to have to use it, though. Roger, would, would we compare that to the, uh, you know, the Hornet variant that can air-to-air refuel, same kind of, operate in the same kind of capacity as that? Yeah, yeah. Correct. Mm. Yeah, not, I mean, not a great use of your time or resources mm. Mm. In, in my opinion. Yeah. Very good. Okay. Do you have an experience with Sandra and Tracy? I'm, I'm afraid you'll have to explain that one. I think Sandra and Tracy, does that, what does that say? What does it say in the notes? Look to the right. Tiled pod. Tiled. Oh, yeah, I do. Yeah, I have a lot of experience with, with tiled. Yes, I do. We'll look at the link. So I've spent a lot of time um, over Iraq using tile pods, uh, aiming... Um, aiming but not dropping um, laser-guided weapons. Um, so the, the answer to that is, is yes, and then they, they seem to work very well, um, although I never use tiled in anger. Um, mm. but, uh, but there we are. Is it was this... a bit of an urgent fitting, wasn't it? Yes, like it was. Like... Yeah, yeah. So it was, it was fitted then uh, in time for... Uh, it was used, I think, uh, after because after the Buccaneers... Did the uh, did it in had to had to do the designation for the tornadoes in in Gulf War One. Uh, it was then rapidly retrofitted to the GR One fleet, if I remember correctly. Okay, I have a question that's been bugging me for about two years now, and I'm finally going to come out with it. Why so many pods? Tiled, Lightning One, Lightning Two, Sniper, Sniper, whatever. Uh, other ones I can't even Fleur. All these different pods. Why didn't they just make one and everyone use it? Because different companies have slightly, everything's always slightly improved, and different people want to make money in di- different places. So it's just free market competition, then. Yes, it is. Oh, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. And all these things, of course. Remember that every time you're looking at something. When I when I left the air force, I went to do um, work down at um, Farnborough at the Defence Science Lab as a freelance consultant. And a lot of a lot of time we were evaluating. You know, should we buy? Should we buy? For example. Should we buy the um, Boeing 737 tanker or should we buy the A330 tanker? Should we buy the Paveway uh, 3 or should we buy the Matra um, JDAM? You know, so all of these questions, so that, so that, that, you know, about the capabilities, you've got to, there's always, the way we do our procurement, there's always at least two in the final mix. Uh, JSF, you know, JSF, I mean, 
the analysis that uh, that I completed back in whenever it was before JSF with JSF was on the drawing board actually said that we should have gone for a you know a Nimitz sized carrier and uh, and a uh, Super Hornet sized aircraft mm. or a Raptor sized aircraft. Uh, but because the the what became the JSF was twelve percent cheaper, but could only go half as far and carry half as much, and the carrier was three quarters of the price, and it had a it had a ski jump, and the Navy loved ski jumps. That was the one that got the nod, despite the analysis. Mm. So that's why we have the JSF now. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. Right. Uh, okay. Let's push on, shall we? Can you relate any experiences where the uh, where the Iraqi forces were surprisingly cunning, or did something you did not anticipate? So, any particular experience? Yeah, absolutely. The the one my one uh, combat situation uh, or two combat situations, but I'll give the one over Mosul. Uh, was particularly interesting. They're, they're both very similar, but we're over Mosul, and this is uh, this is before Flying Fox, and we're in a we're in a in a warm war, so no one's firing at each other yet. Uh, and what we're doing is is we are flying pairs of tornadoes out of um, Incirlik, out of Adana, in um, southern Turkey. We're going we're flying due east, parallel to the Syria-Turkey border. Then we're turning south over the dams, uh, over Mosul, and left over the um, Kurdish areas, and what we're doing is we're using our pods to take super uh, photo pods uh, to take super high res pictures of um, Iraqi troop movements and especially artillery positions. We are escorted, generally speaking, a pair of tornadoes escorted by a pair of F 16s with harms, uh, outride, you know, outriders, a shotgun, and then we've got a pair of F 15s above us at 35,000 feet and above uh, flying top cover. And after and so of course what we would do is that the, the iraqis would got really irritated because we'd started doing this and i guess we would have been i don't know maybe this is six months in and we got really good at it uh, and of course as part of the kill chain what was happening was our picks were being passed on to certain people who were embedded with uh, other people who would then go on raids at night and they would then take out um take out iraqi forces you know um in the way that they did. Um, and um, so the Iraqis added up um, two and two and realized that if they saw a pair of tornadoes coming over, that there would be a strike a couple of days later um, in certain areas. So that they, so what they started doing was they started firing at us. And the way they did it was really clever. The fir first of all, they just started locking us up and then tracking us and then so on and so forth. But the first real scary moment for me was was when they actually launched and we got a we got a call of, of Sam Sam so and of course my um, my um, RWR was uh, was it was Christmas tree and it was warbling and missile guidance so we were we were so my pilots could say shall I bang the tanks off I don't know don't bang the tanks off it's fine we wait to see the missile and so we we didn't actually see the missile. Uh, and it, the F-16s um, didn't fire either that day. Um, but uh, but what happened was one of the F-16s saw it, and, of course, it, it had just gone ballistic. So what they're doing is they were just testing our responses. Uh, and um, it turns out that they were firing. They did, of course, everybody wants to find out what went on. And, of course, we had back then, I think, Tony Blair and Robin Cook were all interested, Robertson were interested in what was going on. And the analysis was that they'd started firing, they'd started using SA-6 mm -hmm. um, um, radar, uh, and that they would long track, and they would be using Katyusha, single Katyusha mm -hmm. rockets, um, uh, just fired ballistically. Because the ground plume was the same, you couldn't tell the difference. Obviously, after the initial burn phase, the SA-6 comes towards you and does a kind of a, uh, a corkscrew towards you as it as it homes in, but of course the Katusha just goes straight over your head. Uh, the very next day, um, one of our crews went out, and the F sixteen actually the F sixteen fired, which shut them up. And then uh, I think maybe two weeks later, uh, Operation Flying Fox started, uh, and uh, we all went hot and decided to take out all of their SAM sites. So I think this, that would have been September ninety seven. You can check the you can check on Google though. Or so yeah, so, so yeah, they're, so their kind of testing of us was really interesting. And that's really that is really interesting. This Katusha rocket is—is is this? Sorry, is it an air to? Is it a ground-to-ground -ground rocket? Or have I missed that completely? Oh, yeah, yeah, you know, the, you know the BM twenty-seven. Uh, you know, multi multi-barrel rocket launcher thing. Yeah, yes, I do. So just firing one of those, 
Right. Single one of those. Okay. How interesting. Yeah, okay. Lots of people going on. Roger. Okay, very good. Uh, let's push on. Did the prospect of being an airline pilot after the services never appeal to you? No, no, not ever. Never. I, I thought, I, I, you know, I actually think flying airlines is one of the most boring <laughs> things. Same here. On the planet, I really do. And I speak to, you know, I speak to mates and, and, and I say to them, you know, how is it? And they said, it is possibly the most boring job in the world. You know, for example, if you're doing long haul, triple seven to San Diego, it's 10 hours of utter boredom. If there's any weather at the other end, you know, heavy rain, wind, crosswind, cloud, storm, it's then, you know, two minutes of sheer terror. Uh, so, it, you know, it's uh, it's never something for me. I don't think I could, I don't think I could waste my life mm -hmm. doing that, really. Uh, you know, I take my hats off to the people who do it. I don't know how they do it, honestly. I take my hats off to the guys that play X-Plane and simulate doing that. It's like, oh, my God. <laughs> I, I, I just couldn't look at oh, right, anyway anyway let's not go down that rabbit hole I'll get angry again um where do we get to what advice would you give to aspiring RAF aircrew oh never give up believe in yourself uh, I think that the best advice though is organize is get your, get your brain organized because the, the thing about flying is that is that you've got to think ahead You've got to be about a minute ahead in all situations and anticipate every situation. So it's being organized in your bonds for things that are coming up and not ending up behind the aircraft. End up behind the aircraft, you, you lose your SA, your situational awareness, and you're then, you are then hopeless, um, I suppose. So, so I would say it really is about cockpit organization and making sure that your SA is, you, you know, your understanding of what is going on all the time and just thinking through what might happen, the various scenarios. Apart from that, you know, I would say believe in yourself and be yourself. Don't try and be somebody who you're not because people will spot that. Roger. Be yourself and just, just do it. You know what? That, you know what, That's obviously great advice and real life advice. Uh, one thing I find that quite that's quite interesting is how well that advice also applies to DCS. Uh, what you've said, the the be yourself. Well, the the one I get loads of people coming to me and said, "How do I be successful in DCS? Not not just in flying a plane, uh, but also in getting people to watch you on your YouTube channel, all the stuff like that." And I my advice is always be yourself. Don't let anyone try and get you to do it their way do what you want and the other thing about the understanding of the not the battlefield the understanding of what's going on and what could happen all the time the situational awareness how important that is in dcs as well not on the same scale yeah. as real life but it really is isn't it no it's not far away at all i mean it is it is the only thing the only difference i think with dcs is you're not putting g i mean it really mm -hmm. is in vr and, and therefore you've you've lost any sense of you know you are completely immersed mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so all these little routines you, you, you learn is, as you're doing DCS just the same all mm -hmm. the little subroutines all the little self checklists you have for all the different things you know and when you're when you're operating a complex aircraft like the Viper or the Hornet with the myriad of different weapon systems and the sensors and the pod and 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 and, and you know all of those technical things knowing all those learning all those little checklists by heart so you you know what you're doing and in no doubt i mean that is as much a skill as being able to plug into the back of a, a basket down the back of a kc135 mm -hmm. absolutely <laughs> <laughs> can you do that yet i'm saying nothing <laughs> allegedly yeah. uh, you did you did um you did some refueling instruction I I did, I did, and I have, I have plugged, and I have, to, I have received fuel. But thank you for checking, Ironwolf. <laughs> for Mig Twenty Nines, wasn't it? <laughs> oh yeah, sorry, no, I've done it for real. Yes, I have. Yeah, no, yeah, I, yeah, I did. We did um, Operation uh, or Exercise Flying Fish down over the South China Seas, uh, and so we did it in con in concert with the Aussies, the New Zealanders, the Malaysians, the Singaporeans, and ourselves operating out of the old um, um, RAAF base at Butterworth. Um, and uh, we were doing um, air-to-air -air instruction for the uh, Malay MiG-29s from our cockpit to their cockpit, so flying in close and talking them on um, and just giving them, you know, the, the advice like, you know, fire smoothly, don't, don't watch the basket, I can see it. stop watching the basket, I can mm -hmm. see your head moving, mm -hmm. stop watching the basket. You know, so those, yeah, so, yeah, for real, it's a dog as far as I'm concerned, from the back seat as well. <laughs> you can charge 20 pounds for that now mm -hmm. <laughs> right on that note let's get back on track 
Uh, did you ever consider any other roles in RAF, such as pilot slash ATC? No. No, no, uh, no. It, it, when I was at Crown, at officer training, they said to me, uh, um, Simon, why don't you, why don't you take up your, why don't you go to university? Because I had a place at Manchester. Do, why don't you to go, to, take up your university and go and, and come back and try pilot training? Because they said you may not be mature enough to be an officer yet. And, and I, so I considered it, and I thought, no, I'll give it a whirl. And if I fail, I'll go do something else. So, uh, so briefly is the answer when I was still a teenager. But since then, no, n- never thought about doing anything else. And never regretted either. No regrets. Roger. No but, very good. That's how to live a life. Um, off the record, between me and you, how f- low have you flown? I'm guessing that's going to be in the buck. Yeah, it is. Uh, I think um, two airfield attacks come to mind. One deliberate, one not. Uh, the best one was the best one was Inverness Dalcross, uh, leading a six, six ship of buccaneers on a mallet blow. And there were two low flying incidents. This very briefly. One was we had a gorilla of, I think, 28 aircraft with the Buccaneers up the front, obviously, and the 111s down the back. Uh, and we would get airborne from Larbrook, transit over Holland, drop down to over the sea, up what was called the, the low-level high-speed transit corridor. So in the Buccaneer, you'd sit at about 37 feet, hands off, on the deck. Hmm. Um, so at 540 knots. Uh, what was really interesting was getting bounced by, fat, by phantoms out of Watersham, uh, and out of um, uh, it would have been um, not uh, not Coltshall. Um Can't remember the one near Boston. The one near no one near, near UCAP. Uh, oh, and God. The America, uh, American or English? Sorry, well, no, English. Oh God, Marum. Uh, anyway. Sorry, Marum. No, not Marum. Uh, I would want to say Coltshall, but it's not. It'll come to me later. Collingsby. 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 There we are. Collingsby, and of course the lightnings out of Bimbrook. And then the F4s out of Lucas. Anyway, we were past. We were we were up, up just at the top of the corridor on the deck, going past Bimbrook, and the Lightnings were doing base defence because that's all they could do. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and um, we got a call of Buster, you know, bandits, which were Lightnings who'd been vectored onto us by the GCI at Bulma, probably. And about two minutes into this, you know, we were essentially at thirty feet on the deck doing five eighty. We were overtaken by the 111s hey. doing 1.1 at the same height about 100 <laughs> meters to our left and right going you think you're cool but we're cooler and i was super impressed by that mm-hmm. yeah, wow so, well, dale cross was another one which is where i got slightly lost we we ended up in scotland i think we were supposed to be an airfield attack at kinloss or Lothie, and we were trying to get into or out of the great glen a six ship of buccaneers weather was shocking you know there was a bit of clag all over the place luckily number six uh a chap called tony dakin realized where we were and which was about to crash through dal cross and bu- bugled up dal cross and said if it is dal cross this is bobcat formation six buccaneers for air foot attack 30 seconds out do you accept and the control dal cross said bobcat we accept anyway so the first thing i know is there's an airfield and we're all at super low level. So we crash through the airfield. I realise where we are. Oh, that can only be Dal Cross. I size so Bobcat leads off to Dal Cross for 30 seconds. So, so I go to apologise because there are two British Midland or whatever they were back then uh, aircraft at the end of the runway. And I say, uh, yeah, Inverness Dal Cross, hello, this is Bobcat Lead. I'm really sorry. We just cra-. And they said, oh, hello, Bobcat Lead. We've been waiting to hear from you. Your number number six cleared you through. So. So that was uh, that was also quite cool. Yeah, I mean, you brought back some vivid. But you know, when you hear something and suddenly amazing memories and smells come back, I really yeah. miss where I used to live. I used to live not that far from here, actually, with my mum, which must have been one of the best places, maybe even in the world, for uh, aviation. Which is I've ended up here, so you know, maybe there was, there was a reason yeah. for that. And um, it was a beautiful corridor. If you go and look at the aviation maps out, it's a beautiful corridor. We've got Mildenhall, RAF Mildenhall, RAF. Uh, uh, Lake and Heath, uh, RAF, um, uh, Alconbury, um, go east, you've got two more, you've got Coningsby and so on. And it's just this much. And I remember vividly, uh, we had all sorts of planes, A-10s, F-15s, F-16s, um, uh, all sorts, F-4s. And the two, two, two really impressive ones, which are gone now, obviously, the Tornadoes and the F-111s. And because they would seem to break the rules well if there were any rules because they would come over just just a couple of hundred feet uh not max speed but wings back and fast 
um, and and you just hear a rumbling, and this thing would just blast over your house and nearly take your windows out. And that was the most impressive ones, those two planes. And uh, we didn't have buccaneers; they just went on the on the flight line. But I have said. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but um, anyway, that's just uh, my amazing memory that I've forgotten about. It's just come back. Anyway, let's uh, let's move on. I will unleash you at some point when we get to the end because I know you're desperate to be unleashed and talk about anything. But uh, let's stick to the the plan for now. Hey, Simon Seahorse here. Uh, please make a buccaneer module. My life would be complete. I mean, there's something I think there's a lot of planes. Um, and the, my my complaint in DCS at the moment, as you well know, is our lack of kind of fifties to I yeah. guess mid seventies planes. It's just covered it by what a mig 21 which is great and uh an f5 which is great but you've got some of the what i would consider best not best as in their win fights but um i don't know um what do i mean i don't really just 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 things like the f4 just really good planes that are played a massive part in history um in, in that thing and anyway i don't know i don't know where i'm going with this really but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm with Seahorse, I and mean, I do get it. I'd love to see. I mean, I'd love to see before the Buccaneer. I'd love to see the Phantom, mm -hmm. and I'm sure that we have that. In, we have that in train. It's very, very early stages, though. But we mm -hmm. are definitely going to see the Phantom. Roger. I'd love to see the as well, by the way. But uh, you know, um, yeah, I, and I've been watching your Cold War mm -hmm. series uh, mm -hmm. of aircraft we must have in DCS mm -hmm. with increasing fascination and nodding in agreement to every single one. Um, you know, it's uh, you know. I suppose it's just time and it's time and resources mm. and you know, things cost a lot of money and a lot of time yeah. and effort to to, uh, to produce. Yeah. So. Also, you got that. You, you got to have the market there as well. And what I'm finding is that uh, like we, don't, we don't want to think about it, but we are unfortunately dinosaurs. The the things that we loved in our childhood and adolescence and teenage years and whatnot are not what the youngsters, you know, want now. They all want their yeah, their lightnings. Look at the look at the market on your uh, on for your um, your tutorials though. Mm. Those that those people who are not all young, who are arguably more much older, they'd all be delighted to get mm. into an F four mm. uh, front or back, uh, and you know really truly understand it. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, or, or even have a have a wrought about in a, in a hunter. Mm. So you've done as well, which is, would be terrific. I love the hunter. Same here. And they flew flew it quite a lot and adored it mm. not much of the hawk but you know mm. okay let's push on for now what is your favorite aircraft in dcs at the moment if you say the hornet i'll kill you and which upcoming module are you most looking forward to my favorite aircraft in dcs at the moment is the mustang yay <laughs> those warbirds are great <laughs> aren't they they really yeah, are I'm great right. They are. They're, they're, they're just they're stunning. And I love the Mustang because it, it can do everything really well. You know, it's not the best at everything, but mm -hmm. can, it, you know, it gets kind of a a plus question mark. Uh, you know, as you know, the Spitfire dogfight a plus. You know, so so it, it's it's the Mustang can do everything really well. It's mm -hmm. very forgiving aircraft too. It's very easy to taxi to take off. Very difficult to crash. And once you understand mm -hmm. engine management, it, it's a beauty. But I do go through phases though. So, um, you know, I have in the past year been deeply in love also with the F-86, which I adore. Mm -hmm. um, the, the MiG-15 I find is really hard. Oh, I love it. Hard is it's, good. Yeah, yeah, no, hard is good. Hard is good. But again, the F-86 for me has that right balance mm -hmm. of fun and complexity and ease and weapons. Um, the uh, F-5 I adore because mm -hmm. it is it, it's steam-driven. Very mm -hmm. similar. It's like a super Mm -hmm. um and very capable um so and i do adore the f-18 yeah obviously i do mm -hmm. uh, but uh, you know given today today i'm in a mustang phase i confess mm -hmm. um, these we noticed. The because i think it's really hardcore that uh, it is it is it is at least i think it is more rewarding to get the warbirds right yeah um than it is the modern jets, which is so, when you get back into Hornet, you think, well, I don't have to worry about anything. I don't worry about speed, engine temperatures, how much I'm pulling, but I don't, you know, you don't have to aim anything, basically. You just fire it all off and it's, you know. Exactly. It's systems, systems management. So, and it's a completely different feeling. It's still a great feeling to get it right, but it's a completely different feeling. Yeah. You know, landing the model, whereas, you know, the, the, you know, the, the, the tail dragger landings are always a challenge. So I'm really looking forward to the P-47. Uh, yep. you know, that, and I, I've test flown it and it's mm -hmm. it's tremendous so Good. tremendous 
super stable gun platform. So the P-47 is going to be fantastic. The only thing I haven't done yet is fired the rockets in it, but I've done everything else. I'm going to love it. Modra. I mean, there's a couple of things I pick up on there. One is the the reward. Um, absolutely. Um, and, and we have to accept not everyone's like us. Not everyone gets that uh, reward. But people like us... Um, I don't know how to describe us, but you know what I mean. Uh, we to, to take a war battle in a mission, in a proper mission, especially in a multiplayer mission, to be able to take the thing off without crashing, to be able to do right. some sort of mission. I'm not saying you have to get in a cool dogfight and shoot stuff down. You don't. You just just be able to fly it with your guys and then come and then land it without dying. The amount of achievement yeah. that comes with that sets you off for the rest of the week, doesn't it? Uh, and that this can't be repeated war. anywhere else. You can't get that yeah, from many hornets. You, you can't get that. No, you're absolutely correct, and I know it's. I know it's really. Uh, I know you spend a lot of time in the in the 109 uh, camp, yeah. mm. um, but uh, the hardest thing to do, I think, is is the air to mud stuff. Mm-hmm. In, is the is the rocketing and getting mm-hmm. getting the getting the close air support stuff right mm-hmm. in the warbirds is the hardest thing you'll do, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and there's and the other thing is there's something special, and I can't quantify it as ever. It's a feel thing, and like when we interviewed Nick, feels very important. Don't ignore it. Feel. Um, it's good, and we play um, we play IL two a lot, and I would never say anything bad about uh, IL two. It's very good. It's very good fun. Go and download it. Blah blah blah. But phone fly that, and then come back and fly the DCS Warbirds. And a, it's ten million times harder. But b, there is something special about the feel of the Warbirds that the guys have done and made it. That I can't say it feels like a real plane because I never flown a real plane and never will. But uh, gives you an amazing reward and realism, and just connects you with the plane better than anything else I've ever tried. Yeah, and it also connects you with a whole generation of heroes as mm-hmm. well. You know, I, I almost feel that when I'm flying it, I do it as a tribute to that generation. Mm-hmm. Without sounding too cheesy, I hope. Absolutely. No, cool. Right, I, we must stay on track. We must stay on track. Uh, so we talked about that, and yep, I agree with that. Um, this week, Rasbam have teased yet another plane they're bringing out, the EE Lightning module in early development, which for me, when, I, when people ask me my favourite plane, I always say electric... That one, the Lightning F6 variant, the F104, one of those variants, um, and the B1, although the B1 doesn't really count in this case. Uh, so it's a big moment for me. Did you ever have any experience operating alongside Lightning squadrons? And do you think this will be a good module for DCS? Uh, yeah, I do. I mean, I do. It's not one I would have chosen personally. I but maybe if they maybe if they would not 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 been allowed to do the F four, I can see why mm-hmm. they've gone for the lightning. I, just, mm-hmm. I wonder if there are more. I mean, the the, the Sea Harriers in the Sea Harriers in development, isn't it? I understand. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there are other. Uh, you know, I would I would have preferred to see an F one hundred four, for example. Mm-hmm. Um, especially when you look at the numbers that the Europeans had during the Cold War, mm-hmm. um, the one hundred four Gs. Um, but will it be good? I think it'd be enormous fun. You know, it's it's a double rocket ship uh, that can not go very far. You're going to spend a lot of time behind the tanker. Not sure how good the red was it red top and fire streak it, it flew with. Mm-hmm. Um, so um, so yeah, I mean I, I you know I do remember the Buccaneer, the, the Lightning's um, always being somewhere near Bimbrook and somewhere near a tanker. Yep. Um, because they couldn't be anywhere else. I think it'll be enormous fun. Uh, I mean, I do hope it'll be a, a bestseller. Mm-hmm. I think it could be absolutely terrific. But uh, yeah, don't do, 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 do know, to be honest. <laughs> I mean, like you said, like you said, um, I, I love the idea because I love it. But also, I would love it anyway because. Um, uh, like you said, you said before, the lightnings can't do anything, and that's so true. They can't do anything. They can barely intercept a you know a, a bomber without running out of fuel. They can't do any ground attack. They can't do anything, um, which is kind of like a, a, a red shirt to a bull to me. It's like I'm going to use that for everything. The guys have that on it, and they'll, they'll have their tomcats, and I'm going to be in the lightning just to prove you can do it. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm with you on that, and, and you know, I, I'd love to see a fox bat for the same reason mm, yep. with, with, four ac- with four acrids on it. Mm-hmm. Um, although, you know, there, there is a very good story that the first kill of Gulf War One was a fox bat with an acrid mm-hmm. against an F-18. Mm-hmm. So, um, your history guys might want to check that out. But I, I forgot though. I do, I do actually owe my Air Force career, I think, to the Lightning because um, I was very, I'm a, and still am, a very keen uh, train buff. Um, and I wanted to be a train driver, and I think it was extra air day 1969 it would have been, so I'd have been eight. And these are the days before the Ramstein crash, so, mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. Um, you know, jets were allowed over the crowd. And this lightning came over Exeter, the crowd at Exeter, at probably 35 feet. Mm-hmm. And he was probably doing 595. Um, he wasn't quite supersonic. And you can imagine, mm-hmm. nobody saw 
saw it coming. And then there's this big, whoa, mm -hmm. boom. And everybody dropped their ice cream and their teas, except me. I held on to mine because I saw him coming. Mm -hmm. and, I thought, and that's when I thought, I've got to do that. And that was, for me, that was the moment where I thought, oh, that is what I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. and, so, and that was the lightning. Yeah. Oh, I remember I it was triggered another one of those early memories of I remember mid eighties. Well, I don't know really. Yeah, know. Early memories, don't you? Get yeah, all I, they're, all, they're all coming thick and fast now. Now I sort of remember the early eighties, so I would have been, you know, just in my just just. Just, just that theory would just start to remember when I was six or seven. And um, although it was a USAF base, they would have British planes there and lightnings and stuff. And again, uh, there was some health and safety coming in. But compared to now, um, you know, they were flying really close. And the lightning and the F-111 and the B-1 right in front of your face, right over the runway instead of half a mile away. And yeah. I can still smell the aviation fuel because you were so clear. I remember those days well, but... Never mind. Uh, I mean, it was also the first one we saw it in the, the F-15, F-16 and yeah, F-18. It was the first one that could really, you know, you, you, you'd get airborne, put the gear up, both heaters in, mm -hmm. hold it down, you know, 50 feet off the end of the runway, stand it on its tail mm -hmm. and go vertical. Mm -hmm. And there was nothing else that could really do that until the F-15 came along. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, hats off to it just for that. Roger. Okay. Um, we've got a couple of ones I've just added, and then we are go into kind of tail telling and stuff like that and just mucking around whatever we want to do. So one really interesting thing is, as you very, very well aware, we are not a Milsim group. It's just not our thing, you know, and it's not right or wrong. It's just how we are. Uh, but one thing that you brought to me that I've yet to implement and I want to is navigation. Obviously, this should come from you. Uh, navigation in DCS. So we take for granted in DCS navigation. We have a, let's say, a whole it um, and as navigate it has INS GPS which basically means it has INS which never goes wrong it never corrupts it never gets inaccurate so you just you just plug in your waypoint you fly 3,000 miles you get there and it's just like magic it works perfectly um, now and that is obviously how modern planes work but but like you're saying in the Buccaneer and it kind of all the way up to the kind of I don't know late 80s I suppose you were dealing with systems which at best degraded sometimes or at, at worst would just never really work and you're going to sit there with your compass and your and your watch and your map and whatnot and you brought this into me when you came around that time and we were just talking about missions and designing yeah. some missions and you were saying um you, you should you know you need to come in from this way so that you can see this particular tree so that you can get to that area so you can see that i say what is he talking about just press the f10 map that's what we do because we've <laughs> never really thought about navigation before and how the important it would be of course because what we do if we get lost is we press f10 which you can't do whoops we can't do in real life and um and you cheat uh, so we had the experiment what would happen if you remove f10 altogether and you have to navigate by a a degraded system so not hornets instead go back to the uh the the, the i don't know you know earlier planes where you would have yeah. at best a degraded system and a map uh, you know as in a shitty map on your kneeboard um where, where it didn't show where you were uh and and a, at a timer and we tried that for a for a very small campaign now that ended up in having to cut it early because people started leaving the reapers because it got so um because it got so hardcore people couldn't even get to the mission and but we so, so that was a bit too much too soon i think but we would start to like to introduce that back in especially with period accurate aircraft like a warbird you actually have to gonna get your map out on your knee when you're flying unless you're vr and figuring out where the bloody hell you are any comments about that before i unleash the boys yes it is hardcore uh, there's no doubt about it when you're flying uh, on some of the uh, uh on some of the warbird sims where you don't have any maps uh and it's, especially in vr and you don't have the some of them switch off f10 so or they've got f10 but it doesn't show where you are um so f10 becomes your map essentially mm -hmm. your handheld map mm -hmm. Uh, you, there, you spend a lot of time being lost, or people who haven't done it. So the people who I'm flying with, you know, privately, like my brother Will, uh, like uh, Matthias, uh, our, our guy in Germany, uh, one of our uh, ex exceptional tech guys. Um, you know, they're, they're going well. I'm, I'm well. I'm, I'm by the mast. I'm by the chimney. Well, I can see four chimneys. Well, I'm by the column of smoke. <laughs> where are you related by? I've got no idea where Bayer is. And so the, the, the whole, it changes the entire dynamic, having to navigate as well. And, mm -hmm. and only when you have to navigate, you get some idea. And the, the mm -hmm. entire navigation problem was only really solved with the introduction of twin sat-navs coupled 
to the INS mm -hmm. uh, system. So that was so you know after that everybody knows where they are all the time now. But mm, once yeah. you've got link, link Satnav and uh, an INS all correcting each other, it's fine. So up to about 1997, 98. So before, so after that, problem solved. Before that, it, it was our main concern. We mm. didn't know where we were half the time. I mean, that's a mission in itself. I mean, screw the bombing and everything else. Just navigating to the target, it becomes the mission we found. Yeah, and, and, the, and the, you know, the important things like, so, you, you know, we would spend three hours planning and, and, and you'd mm -hmm. also planning two scales. You'd plan on the half mil. You would plan your, you know, your waypoints and your speeds and your fuels and your bingos and your threat rings and everything. But the, but the most important thing was the IP to target run. So that last, you know, 20 miles, do you plan on a 50 thou map? Mm. You know, and you, you would look at the woods, the the wood shapes, the you know the the small hillocks, the anything that in the buccaneer that would stand out, or in the tornado that you could use as a radar offset, and then you would measure those to within a foot. And uh, so the the amount of detail planning that went into making sure that you, because we usually did lay down or shallow dive, to making sure that you got to your weapon release point with your dumb mm -hmm. weapons. You, mm -hmm. uh, the right time was was you know just astonishing and and you really don't see that today mm -hmm. in in any of the missions i think we got a hint of it in the Carantan mission last week where we mm -hmm. did a you know that train in uh and popped up at the lake and then all down left mm -hmm. onto the onto the uh rail yard but only because i knew where we were <laughs> mm. <laughs> otherwise we'd all be bimbling about we'd all be bimbling about it yeah. you know, no it's real it's 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 it's, it's, it's real. It's it's a real it's a really important thing, and one of the one of my concerns is when we put this video out saying Buccaneer Navigator uh, interview, everyone no one's going to click on it because they're going to say what the hell is a Navigator? I mean that's right, that that's what someone born in the last twenty five yeah, years is going to think. What's a Navigator? Why would you have one in an aeroplane? No, How you should just. Use the use the use kind of Rio Wizzo yeah. Robin Gibb Roger. But it's how know, it's how important it was. Back in our kind of time, if you know what I mean. If, if, yeah, yeah, everything. And the navigator did two things, you know, and you see the Israelis flying with, you know, flying two CF-16s, mm. but why do they do that? You know, simply because of the workload, simply mm -hmm. because, you know, when it gets super complicated, um, e even if he's just the leader of the four ship, having, you know, having one guy who doesn't actually have to pull the aircraft as well, but can do everything else and, na you know, and navigate. Um, is you know it's critical. It, it really is. Roger. Um, just from yeah, bring... when I did a video on that. Oh yeah, we didn't do very well, did we? Got lost. Um, any no, we did great. any comments <laughs> from my GR guys just about what we've been talking about about navig introducing navigation into DCS? It, it reminds me, it, it's fearful. It makes me scared. I remember Same being here. on Cold War with you, a cat. I would rather be shot at. Like... I would rather be shot at by by Amrams than have <laughs> yeah. to navigate. And they're like, "Where's the target?" I'm like. Forget the target. Where am I? I don't even know where I am. And if you don't know where you are in relation to where you're going, you can That's know the lake the target's on. But if you don't know where the lake is, you're in trouble. Hundred percent. The not that lost feeling, and, mm -hmm. and nothing looks like anything. It's mm -hmm. a, a horrible sinking feeling. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I remember it. spending half that mission just trying to figure out where I was. It was it was not a yeah. good feeling. Switching off. Switching off, uh, switching off your own position on F10 and going in something retro like an F5 or, or, or a MiG-21 is a real eye-opener. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we were in, a, a, I don't know, MiG-15s or something. It was yeah. not a good experience. <laughs> but it was very rewarding when we finally did find the target and we did hit it. Mm -hmm. But it was just... Oh, yeah. yeah. Cool. yeah cool. took far too long. I, I did the Hawk the navigation exercise on uh, Nevada. That was good. Obi? I was going to say, I think that's one of the great things about um, turning the F-10 off. I think it it gives you much more of a re rewarding yeah, experience. It does. And, and this is all and, about reward. That's what it's all about. Yeah, and even in the Hornet and the F-16, it makes people learn how to use what you've got in front of you as well, mm -hmm. rather than yes, it, going to F-10. Mm -hmm. And I think it just, I don't know. And the Warbirds, I like the Warbirds without F-10 as well, because I like looking out and identifying... Um, at features on the terrain, figuring out you can flick to F10 then without cheating if it's turned off, and and try and match the map to the terrain. And um, I think the kneeboard as well, where you can mark your position, that's a a good thing in the um, warbirds. Mm. Yeah. 
Well, we're right back to that excellent question about uh, about what advice would you give um, aspiring RAF aircrew and the whole situational awareness thing. So the, the, the whole F-10, I'm here, cheat thing, it gives you that instantly. And therefore, there's no, you know, there's no reward. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like going to McDonald's and, you know, you might love. <laughs> Roger. They go from one, from I, one is, uh, I'm hungry satisfied. <laughs> from Monday's Warbird mission, no F-10 map. Yeah, oh that's God, it. Turn I, it off. You can, have, you can have the F10 map, and you will need the F10 map for those of us in VR, but just don't, yeah, but don't have any positions. No, no positions on it. Yeah, yeah, I think I'm all for that, but I think um, <laughs> I think I have a call work. and ask could be that day. <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys, let's just push on for now. We'll, we'll discuss this in in our in our time. Last one before. Uh, do you wish DCS had a better mission planner like Combat far Flight? Now I don't know what Combat Flight is, so someone needs to explain the problem and the what that means. Well, um, combat. I've oh, got Iron Wolf. No, you go. I was going to say, well, combat flight is a it's a separate program. Have you ever used it, Cap? No, you, you need to explain it because so, the viewers won't know either. But what you can do, you can export your DCS mission file into combat flight, um, and it will take all the information like unit positions, um, waypoints, uh, flight paths, things like that, and present it to you on a chart, and you can add into that. A lot more detail of hold points, holding loops. Um, it has a lot of good information with line of sight, threat rings, and it is really good for. Yeah, I think Ian will probably put this question because of what we were just talking about. If you want to plan a low level route in D- DCS, Combat Flight is far, far superior to anything that's in DCS at the moment because you, you can really plan mm. down to the inch which way you want to go and you can. It takes a bit of time, but you, you can get a really good route in, and then you can re-export all that back out and into the DCS, and then the waypoints for whatever aircraft you you're flying are, are in there. And um, it is it's a very yep. very comprehensive tool. The answer is the answer is yes. Uh, it, it, it's it, it's clearly yes. And I've actually discussed um, this with Wags already. Uh, we're both keen to, to have a uh, that DCS has a comprehensive mission planning tool not just a mission editor that, that we have at the moment, um, that, but it, that it does have a proper retro, retro tool as much as anything else. So, you know, so, so, you know, so for example, the, one of the hardest things that we did in the, in the Buccaneer and Tornado forces was over-target, uh, over-target separation. So we, if you were going against the same DMPI, the same aim point, desired mean point of impact, if you're going against the same aim point and you had a four ship of tornadoes you couldn't all just go and drop your bombs willy-nilly the closest spacing without getting all the frag all of the all of the corruption and and debris that comes off you know four thousand pound of high drag dropping um was 40 seconds so at the ip to target at the ip you know 20 miles back you'd have to do a split and you'd have to split and then navigate your way down a down the split uh, so that you arrived over the target from different directions, forty seconds apart. Now that in itself is 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 quite an art and requires something like combat flight to plan. It's almost impossible to do it um, in DCS right now. Mm-hmm. And of course, we don't take into account any kind of over-target debris uh, when dropping bombs. It would, the only thing I think I've seen is the is if you're too low dropping slicks and you end up in the frag in the actual mm-hmm. frag pattern. So, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, definitely, it's the have, answer. We have some pretty good stuff with the Vigan with Time on Target at the moment that allows us to... Uh, it uses sources external from DCS. We have to use a separate program. It allows us to impl- import pre-made flight cartridges into DCS with the Vigan that will give oh, us sep- cool. separate routes to ships. Um, yeah. And it will tell us how exactly how to fly to also we all release our harpoons or whatever they are uh, exactly at the same time. It's really, really interesting stuff. Uh, that side of yeah, things in mission planning. The other day, when when I was my, my final flying tour was at Lossy Mouth on uh, flying in the grid, the GR one B, uh, the with the Sea Eagles, and we would take uh, six ships um, and we transit up up to the middle of nowhere. We would get a position from our uh, Nimrod. Uh, we'd get to maybe fifty miles from uh, usually a you know a Hermes or something, not Hermes. Um, uh, what was it called? I can't remember. British carrier. Uh, we get to within 50 miles. Somebody would take up and have a quick peek, and if, if it was confirmed, you know that would be designated the target. 
we then all set off at 90 degrees to it. We'd all set off and fly so that, you know, we'd go into a long trail, uh, you know, maybe a one minute trail, so we're seven miles apart, and then all turn in place mm-hmm. um, uh, to launch our, what would be 24 seagulls, all to arrive. Mm-hmm. Same time. Uh, arrive at the same time from an arc of 120 degrees. Mm. That's uh, how you kill no, a ship. No, no. That's how you kill a ship, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. Roger. Okay. There's um, also just a couple of comeback for. Um, do you ever do you have any emergency slash ejection stories or anything along those lines? Yeah, a very very quick one. Um, the only time I nearly ejected, uh, I what I didn't. I was I was nearly ejected by my pilot. We were mm-hmm. doing a red flag workup uh, over Lucas. We were down the Great Glen, down just south of Lossiemouth, going down over Loch Ness. Uh, ben Nevis is on our left. Uh, and it's we, we go into near whiteout conditions. We've left it too late to turn around, so we do a full abort, which is uh, three, four G wings level, full burner, uh, 30, 40 degrees nose up. And of course, if you've got no, if you've got no external mm. cues, that kind of pull back and accelerate and push in the back, it, it topples your oolitic canals mm. in your ears. So mm. it feels like you're tumbling backwards. So big, being the good backseater that I was, uh, I went straight down and looked at my Mickey Mouse um, repeater head up, mm. um, HSI, um, horizontal situation indicator, to just to make sure that we were climbing at 30 degrees. And so and we got to, I think, 70 degrees nose up and in a slight right bank. And we're still, we're climbing through about four or 5,000 feet. And, the, and I said to my front seater, I said, Oi, what do you think you're doing? He said, oh, oh I think I've lost it. <laughs> and I said, no, roll, you know, so I then I did, we, we practiced this. So somebody talked about practicing spins. We practiced UP. So you, we put the aircraft into any position the navigator would have to talk a recovery. So I, we did wings level, I pushed, he pushed minus two. Uh, his mm. knee board, which was one of those metal things, which mm. was Velcroed around his right leg, actually detached, hit the canopy between us and smacked me in the face. <laughs> Badly chipped by visor, uh, but uh, then the rad out started to read again. We recovered. We we recovered back to Luke. We we bimbled back to Lucas, uh, and he said to me, "Oh, he said, I'm glad you I'm glad you spoke up because I nearly ejected you." <laughs> <laughs> he said, "I nearly nearly ejected both of us." Uh, we got back to Lucas, uh, and he he was he was so frightened by the whole experience that his he got onto the ladder and fell off it. Uh-huh. Uh, and, or fell down the ladder because his legs wouldn't hold him. So, yeah. and we never spoke about it to anybody ever again. Did you cover it in debrief? <laughs> no. Wow. <laughs> I know. I know. I learned about flying from that. Goodness me. Yeah. So disorientation killed a lot of people. Sadly. Yeah. No. It, it, it yeah. always always has done, isn't it? Um, yeah. uh, and we did not have a scene that I just meant to say earlier. Actually, cat, there was a, about not liking or not trusting your pilot. We did have a guy called Skids who went on to be a <laughs> captain. And Skids was called Skids because he had two navig- navigators on the back and it eject on him. Oh, God. Uh, once was on takeoff where he lost control, uh, put the gear up, went sliding across the airfield at Larbrook and his navigator banged out. Uh, and then six months later, he was. we were doing live thousand pound bombing at uh, Garvey up at the, off the top of Scotland. And he hit, they hit, went through a flock of gannets and um, one smashed the canopy, took the canopy off, uh, and when um, one went down the engine, the navigator thought that the pilot had been hit and lost mm. control. They couldn't hear him. So the navigator banged out into the sea, and mm. the, the pilot poodled back, same pilot poodled back and landed it navigator free again. Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. It's just, just something to pick out there, going on to DCS again. Even in a... a, 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 a was that a tornado so you were talking about when that guy so got lost? So the first one was tornado, where yeah. it was command ejection, where if the navigator yeah. ejects, he, can, eject on, he mm-hmm. can eject on his own. If the pilot ever ejects, though, the navigator always gets ejected and goes half a second before the pilot right. in all circumstances. So on the Buccaneer, uh, it was... Navigator could always eject independently regardless. Roger, and what I was going to say is, so even with a play, modern plane like that, um, even in a Hornet or something with a you know amazing situational awareness, you can easily 
uh, get uh, loss of situation awareness in terms of orientation in any kind of bad weather. I've done it so many times in DCS when I've been in a fight, even in a, a, a Hornet, where I've got no right to lose situation awareness because it tells me everything everywhere. And yet I've got lost in a cloud. Before I know it, I'm going down a Mach 1.3 towards the, towards the water and just complete loss of and that ear thing you were talking about, even on the computer. It, yeah. it doesn't even though I've not got not no I've not got any actual G. Just the confusion of what's going on is enough to kill a pilot in even in a game, let alone having G forces and all that. Yeah, you make an excellent point as well on weather. The, the, the one thing, the, the other big difference, of course, is in DCS, we tend to fly ninety five percent of the oh, time. Yeah. Weather always do, don't we? I mean, my entire two and a half thousand hours fast jet, you know, fully eighty percent of it, I would say, mm. was 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 spent flying mm. what in what i was considered to be clag so you're you've got an overcast you've got maybe England. a 100 foot cloud base the visibility is perhaps five miles yeah maybe a bit further maybe eight miles and it's you, you know so you're peering through the clag and if you've ever been in the north german plane you know it's only ever blue i think 20 percent of the time so mm. when it's so you know that you've got about uh most days you've got a claggy kind of overcast for most of the year and especially between you know september october and the end of april you know it's just it's just doggers the entire time mm. yeah no something I that it might be sunnier to these days though something that, uh, that we could tally up with uh, the navigation introduction to bad weather i i just get shouted at so much by the viewers if i put anything other than perfect weather anyway let's carry on guys okay. Last official question. Could you please tell us a story from one of your operational deployments? So where, anything you fancy saying, basically? Um, I think I've covered all of them, actually. I've done the... I have done... Uh, I've done Mosul. I've done... Um, I've done... Uh, no, not really. I think I've covered most of the interesting ones. Roger. Um Yeah, no. No, okay. I've got... I don't think in that, that respect. I'll open it up to my guys now. Anything you want to talk about, about Simon's real experience or about DCS, you know, now's the time. In, in the, uh, the the Buckney, you said stop watching map. Is it a bit similar to how ships, well, used to navigate? Uh, you know, you'd have a, a plotter, a navigator on a ship. Is it similar to that? But obviously you're, you're turning much faster. Uh, yes, it is. So, so the, the, right from the start, when you do, uh, we, it was a it was a flying jet provost at RAF Finningley near Doncaster, now Robin Hood, whatever it's called, uh, and uh, it was you know it was it was a two forty knots then. So it was so it's always in miles a minute. So everything's plotted in with minute markers. Um, you learn to assess wind, so you can tell wind speed direction, for example, uh, over the sea by looking at wave tops. Otherwise, you just have to take the forecast wind when you're doing overland. Uh, so you're always aiming off by a few degrees um, into wind uh, or, or, or or having to speed up to make your turning points on time. So you'd have real times plotted at every turning point. Uh, and, you know, the, the thing that we always were super hot on was always getting to your time on target, correct time on target was our, was my entire, you know, the, the first six years of my experience of flying jets was 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 time on target, pinpoint navigation to the second uh, using really not very clever uh, equipment. So when Tornado came along and it told the pilot how fast to fly in order to make the next turning point on time, you know, to me that was just amazing, uh, you know, absolutely amazing. Did you ever fly on the Dominies? Yes, I did. Yes, I did an entire tour of the Dominies, yes, as, a, as an instructor in low level on the low level Dominies, uh, which were considered the the hard bastards, for want of a better word, of of navigator flying training. It was the one place where all of the best um, fast jet instructors went uh, to, uh, and that was where really the men were weeded out for the board from the boys. And it wasn't really a. Uh, it was really only. Uh, it, it was kind of a black ball, I suppose, club where. Um, you know, you had to like the cut of their jib. There had to be people who you would actually want to go for a drink with because then you'd have to go and be on a squadron with them as well as being half good at what they did. So they had to have often, you know, a bit of something about them. But even those who were, who were you know, slightly more shy and retiring, if we liked the way they operated, the way that they conducted themselves, the way they organised themselves in the aircraft, if, they're, you know, if their pure navigation skills were faultless, they would then be encouraged to you know, let their hair down a bit because uh, uh, you know there are many many different backgrounds you know my only 
my only my observation, which I think many of you find interesting, is that um, often the younger they were and the non-graduates, they were often much better material for jets than those who'd come, you know, slightly plump from and full of themselves and instant flood of tenants from university. Uh, and I think these, if you look at read Israeli reports, you know, for them, they're you know their best fighter pilots for many years were there, you know, nineteen, twenty, yep. twenty-one. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, um, so that that would be my only comment is you know when you are young and immortal, you know it's uh, you really are. It's an amazing time to to be alive if you're flying jets. Mm-hmm. We went have... on a, a few flights with the Dominies, uh, eighty-two to eighty-five at Finningley. Did you? Um, Fantastic. Yeah. Life. I used to finish work and uh, get down to the the flight area. And if there was a spare seat, I used to jump on the spare seat just to get some oh. flying. Did you um, go to I watched, do the high level stuff, or did you do the low level as well? I did the, the high level stuff. We used to fly up to Stornoway, then across to uh, Lossy Mouth, and yeah, then right. back down there to Finningley. There were there were, were basically um, there were two types of Dominic flying. One was uh, or HS one two five flying. One was. Uh, one was high level and low level. And the high level were two big triangles. There was one big triangle called Southwest. We'd get airborne, go to Penzance. You'd go to Penzance to uh, Wick and then Wick to Finningley. And the other one was was that in reverse, I think. Because you'd go up maybe as far as the Pharaohs and across to uh, Ben Becula and then down to somewhere across Wales and back through the transit corridor and back down to Finningley. So. Yeah, it was, Where, it was amazing it, to go up into the sunset and then... Um, turn 180 degrees to face the east, and it's pitch black. So at one side, you're you're watching the sun go down. You know, there's the crescent sun over the horizon, beautiful sunset. And then you turn 180 degrees, and it's pitch black. Yeah, it's amazing. When you're 35,000 feet. 35,000 feet. That's right. Absolutely bang on. Yeah, yeah. About 35,000 feet. It's a it's a great thing. I mean, I, it's a lot of things people don't don't appreciate either. Is that is that during the Cold War, we spent a lot of time in places like Sardinia and Cyprus. You know, we spent a month every year in, in places like that. And also Goose Bay, Canada, so up in Labrador. So, you know, we would fly um, at, under the northern lights when we were just doing, you know, endless night flying. So, you know, endless northern lights. And I just take, I mean, take it for granted that every night we just have the northern lights. So uh, night flying can be quite amazing. Um, the light conditions are right up in the in the northern hemisphere. Well, I got a, a, a good uh, appreciation for the navigators because with the dominies, the navigators yeah. were sitting in the back where they, they couldn't see out because the blinds were closed down on the window. So the, they had no idea where they were and they had to navigate with the charts and the slide rules and, and stopwatches, like you said. Yeah, and also facing backwards. Yes, facing backwards. <laughs> Yeah, yeah it was bizarre. And also using the sextant, which was something that, that always befuddled me completely. I thought, I just cannot do this. <laughs> well, I, I, I always hoped that I'd get, I always hoped that uh, I'd, I'd get off the plane and they'd say, well, you crashed and you're now going on a survival course. But that never happened. <laughs> The, um, I found one interesting thing I uh, heard you say there is about the youngness of uh, the pilots being at their top skill level. We we, we have a we're quite I guess I guess quite a good recruiting agency for a real air force in that we have sixteen year olds up to seventy year olds flying with us in our full time missions, so we get to see them really well. And I've calculated yeah. that the uh, absolute optimal for the best fighter pilot we're talking about pure fighting and killing of other air targets, so maximum aggression is twenty. After twenty, they get worse and worse and worse. <laughs> Before well, twenty, get worse. So, so me at thirty-nine, you can see why I'm really struggling to keep up. With uh... <laughs> astonishing. Mm. Okay, guys. Anyone? I'm going to have to disappear in five mics because I've got a bucket loads of stuff to do, and I've got to repair the house. Any uh, kind of last cool question or anything? Just uh, quickly, I don't, don't you know you might not be able to say, but you're speaking about your love of the Mustang and its ground attack. Have you had a chance to test the forty-seven, and how does it compare? Yes, I have, and it's fabulous. It's uh, it's super stable, and because because it's got I think seven hundred and fifty rounds of gun, it's got ammunition forever. Mm. So uh, it, the, you know the forty seven is is fantastic, though, and it carries you know three big bombs. Um, the only thing I haven't done is the, with the forty seven is the rocket, but but as a gun platform, you can feel the pedigree already that is subsequent then in the A one Sky Raider mm. and the A ten Thunderbolt. You can feel that. 
my God, this is good for killing shit on the ground. Mm -hmm. Very good. Really? Okay, guys, that's good for me. Uh, time for me to sign off at least. Simon, pleasure as ever, and we'll be seeing you on Monday, presumably, for mission. Yes, you will. Yep, yep, excellent. Okay, I'm going to sign off now. Um, thanks, Simon, and see the rest of you later. All right, thanks, guys. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Simon.